Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. I want to remind you all that we have a celebration of the 400th energy seminar right outside. Uh, take a right and up a few stairs right at the end of the seminar today. I'll remind you again at the end. It's kind of a momentous occasion. I remember shortly after I started doing this job, the 200th anniversary, so it seems like only yesterday. So uh, with that said, uh, we are going to do this uh, seminar in a, a fireside chat format. And the person who nominated Luke to be a speaker is here, Holmes Hummel, who knows him well and knows DOE quite well, and Ira fairly well, uh, running the um, uh, energy equity and uh, just transition program here at Stanford and also being the resident fellow at the Energy Theme House. I think I got all that in. It's hard to keep up with Holmes. So Holmes is both going to introduce Luke and run the uh, fireside chat. I hope you enjoy it and I feel certain you will. And here's one of the people who talked me into doing the energy seminar, Lee Johnson, who is here at the 200th anniversary. I think you may have planned it, Lee. No, but you were there. I remember, I remember. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Holmes and Luke for a very, very timely uh, session today. Holmes. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a beautiful, beautiful day outside. So it's truly a compliment to John Wyant and the conveners of the Energy Seminar that you are as loyal as you are to the series, seeing it all the way through to its 400th edition. It's by stroke of the calendar and luck that uh, I myself am helping host your featured speaker this afternoon, which is Luke Bassett. And to open the conversation, which is a conversation, and thank you for taking seats close enough to be in that dialogue, I'm going to do some scene setting to get us started. First of all, I want to assert right away that energy transitions are a dramatic backdrop to national histories around the world. That's no exception for the United States, and we are in a dramatic moment. This picture, which is courtesy of scholars at the University of Chicago, funded by the National Science Foundation, gives you a picture of the United States history as a nation state through its transitions of primary energy supplies. And what is stark to me is an annotation on the right side that I imagine me penciling this in, shows you what the declared intentions of the United States as a nation are today which is to reach 100% net zero carbon supply of our energy sector by 2050. And the implied dramatics of that transition are what invoke every type of policy instrument at every level of authority you can imagine that would both reward and compel actors in the economy to make haste with that transition. Now, the United States has declared the target that I just edited into the University of Chicago's diagram and declared it to the world, in fact, registered it with the world through the Nationally Determined Contributions Registry under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's not a press release. It's not an executive order that could be overturned lightly, though this could be withdrawn as it has been once before. Instead, it is a statement of intention and a promise to the world that all of our policy instruments will be oriented towards that national interest, and it will have a dramatic effect on both the supply and the demand sides of the flow chart that is published annually by our national labs. In fact, my two friends on the front row from the geophysics department may be forgiven for peering to see the, the tiny lines, the like two pixels wide, for where we think most of the net zero carbon supply energy of the future might come from, while still acknowledging that more than two thirds of the primary energy supply to the US economy today is a carbon based fuel. So in the transition, there are many actors that will be affected and the negotiations among people who represent those stakeholders and the stakes that they have are shaping history. To bring us to this moment, I'm starting at a very, very recent past. In 
that weeks after the election of the current president, there was an in-game negotiation for an energy bill that had been in the works for almost a decade in bits and pieces, committee by committee. It was negotiated by the leading Republican and leading Democrat in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, introduced here by the heralding uh, headline about the bill being introduced, Joe Manchin on the left, Lisa Murkowski on the right, each of them from states that are famously dependent on fossil fuels for their economy, West Virginia for coal and Anchorage, uh, Alaska for its petroleum. But look at the expanse and extent, the diversity of the energy resources and policy questions that were being addressed in a bill that quietly brought $35 billion of additional investment to energy transitions in the United States. That was in December of 2020. When it did finally pass, it was heralded as the first energy policy overhaul in more than a decade. But it was overshadowed within a year by the five-year cycle of US investments in infrastructure that for the first time embraced clean energy transition as a foundational purpose and organizing principle for infrastructure investment. The billion dollar, trillion dollar infrastructure bill law called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law after it was passed has a tally that you cannot see for the size of this font, but down in the bottom is $75 billion of named allocations for investments in clean energy infrastructure transition. The following year, the negotiations over Build Back Better, which was a companion piece to the bipartisan infrastructure law, ended. And they ended at a moment when some people thought they could not be recovered. Then in the summer of 2022, the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee met with this, the majority leader for the Senate and brought to the table the Inflation Reduction Act. Within three weeks of introducing the bill as legislation, it was enacted as law. Some of you study that bill today. The Inflation Reduction Act shapes many incentives and new business models that are emerging from Stanford innovators. The federal investments as a result of this spate of policy are at a historic scale. They include not just the three bills that I described to you, but also the Chips and Science Bill, trying to orient manufacturing of semiconductors back in the United States, another multi-billion dollar bill. For those of you that are not acquainted with this part of US energy policy history, I can commend you to the websites that are dedicated to each one of those pieces of legislation, build.gov, cleanenergy.gov, chips.gov, one of my favorites, energycommunities.gov. That's actually where you can find a database that will mine for you provisions across virtually all of the policies and programs authorized in any one of those four bills that could help a community make the transition. It's well and neatly organized into the three different types of policy instruments. And the one that we're going to be focusing on today because of Luke Bassett's expertise and interest is tax credits. But Luke Bassett was a pivotal figure as a policy advisor to Chairman Joe Manson for all four of the bills that we just described. Before I continue on, I want to give you a sense of magnitude. I've given you, I hope by intonation, a sense of significance. But this is a sense of where the money went in the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act by category of investment. These are dramatic and record-breaking national commitments. However, they vary by the type of policy instrument that deploys the money. And that's better depicted in this next analysis, which actually, let me be clear, is only for the Inflation Reduction Act. I want to draw your attention to the right-hand side in particular, where if I add this light blue trapezoid that says individual tax credits to the red semicircle for business tax credits, you will see that it is approaching two-thirds of all of the money deployed as credit into the US economy against tax liabilities that accounts for the investment in clean energy and the Inflation Reduction Act. 
the tax credit provisions are implemented at the United States Department of Treasury, which is rarely called to represent U.S. energy policy in Stanford's own energy education. That's why I think this is an exceptional and unique opportunity for the fireside chat ahead. So let me turn attention to the tax credits very briefly to note some things up front for those of you that are new to this part of energy policy. The first thing to know is that starting in 2005, when clean energy tax credits became a more familiar instrument for energy transition, they were limited to for-profit companies only. Nonprofit company need not reply. University, school, community-based organization, tribe, municipality, rural electric cooperative association, no, need not apply. The 30% off sale on clean energy was only available to for-profit entities and the investors that had stakes to own them. So it's extremely significant that there was a leveling of the playing field to make sure that all incorporated entities could claim those tax credits regardless of their status and their tax liabilities. The direct pay option was complemented by some bonus tax credits. And to finish my opening remarks, I wanted to expose you to these pictures so that you'll be able to have them in mind during our dialogue. This, for example, is a picture of a spatial analysis of the United States by the impact on employment expected for places that have employment in the National Association of Accounts, the national accounts for our economic activity that's above a certain threshold for fossil fuel employment. So with the expectation of energy transition comes an expectation of the effect on workers in the fossil fuel economy. For those places that had fossil fuel workers above a certain threshold, those places could then receive higher returns on their investments in clean energy as a result of the bonus tax credit. Now, who gets the tax credit exactly? It depends on who owns the assets. And that might be one of the lines of inquiry that you want to explore. The orange and yellow areas are places where there are coal power plants, retired or soon to be retired, and they also qualify for this bonus tax credit. There's also a third category that qualifies for the bonus tax credit, which means that these are the most lucrative places to make investments in clean energy in the United States today. And that is places that are brownfields, recognized and categorized by the Environmental Protection Agency for recovering from past contamination. The extent and the expanse, and frankly, the geographic diversity of the bio brownfields astonishes me every time I see the map, but it also assures me that there's no place in the country that you can't find a place that would qualify for the bonus tax credit. The last of the maps is the Justice 40 map, which is, by its technical name, the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool map, which is a composite of six different indicators, which each themselves are a product of a composite set of indicators drawn mostly from our social sciences data sets at the federal level that give us a sense that these are places that have endured long-standing and persistent disinvestment or underinvestment. And it is the policy of the current administration to aim for 40% of the benefits of all of our clean energy investments to reach these areas. Now, the Low Income Communities Bonus Tax Credit Program uses one of the indicators that's in the Justice 40 map, and this is a program that is implemented by the Department of Energy. I mean, it's one of the few tax credit policies that can actually be depleted. It can run out. And I make this point emphatically because the other tax credits are actually functionally limitless. The tax credits are there for as long as they're authorized to anyone as long as they are eligible. And that means that the amount of ultimate investments is not even yet known through the tax credit policies. So to close my opening remarks and set the stage for a fireside chat with Luke Bassett, I wanted to show you the same four laws that I introduced you to for the scene setting and point out the extraordinary compression in time. It was less than two years of distance between December of 2020 when the Energy Act of 2020 was enacted and August of 2022 when the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Luke Bassett was the policy advisor to the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee during the time of all four of those bills. There are a few people alive today who would say that the PDFs of each one of those pieces of legislation passed through his hands on the way to the ultimate decision makers. 
And there's no doubt in my mind that the ultimate decision makers never had as much time, care, attention, or depth of expertise that Luke could bring to examining the text line by line. It's a great privilege of mine to be able to introduce Luke Bassett because we first were colleagues together at the Department of Energy. That was back when I served as the senior policy advisor at the Department of Energy's Office of Policy and International Affairs. Luke Bassett arrived to start a meteoric rise in his career while earned out of a graduate degree at Yale in environmental studies and a stint at the Council for Environmental Quality, working with colleagues across the way. At the Department of Energy, Luke made an immediate impact on the climate and energy policy team that I was a part of. It was a pleasure to work with him then, and after I departed in the second term, Luke stayed on and worked with the clean energy team in energy efficiency and renewable energy until the end of the second term. Luke went on to join John Podesta at the Center for American Progress, defending the gains of the last administration, and then working with authorities at different jurisdictions, specifically states, to use their policy instruments to continue the work of national energy transition. In 2018, when Senator Joe Manchin was reelected, Luke, who is from West Virginia, had the occasion to meet with the senator who offered him the opportunity to advise on what nobody could have known would have been the upcoming spate of legislation that was enacted. And so it is our privilege to welcome today the U.S. Treasury's Inflation Reduction Act Office, Director of Policy and Program Impact, Luke Bassett, for a conversation about place-based policy, tax incentives, and geopolitics. Please help me warmly welcome Luke Bassett. Luke, you joined 400 former seminar participants, and so we're thrilled to be celebrating that milestone with you here now. It's auspicious. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to tell us about your arrival in this moment from your own first-person story, because you've taken a road less traveled by many people from West Virginia to a place that has had extraordinary contribution to a field that many people here have studied with great care, but without that level of proximity. Tell us about the earliest days of your upbringing that brought you the values and the direction that you chose to pursue. Yeah, first I, I want to say thank you, Holmes and Dr. Wyant and Stanford, uh, for inviting me. I know exactly how much of an honor it is to both work with students who are invested in this material and this um, really vital issue and the entire community here uh, thinking about these policies and technologies and new businesses and, and all of it. So I really appreciate being here. Um, to answer your question, yeah, I'm, I'm Luke Bassett. I'm from West Virginia. And that is a part of my uh, upbringing and identity and, and now career that um, I've been really fortunate to be able to think back on and you know, carry forward from uh, stories and events in my even high school um, stretch of life, where you know back then in the '90s, um, I didn't really know if I wanted to stay in West Virginia or you know identify with a lot of the folks I grew up with or the traditions in my home state. Um, and it, then I was told at one point by my parents that I would be joining the 4-H club and uh, raising pigs to go to the auction at our county fair. And I didn't know how to really process that, but suddenly I was in it. I was in the mix with fellow 4-Hers who were, you know, I don't think necessarily identifying with the, the mainstream, the cool kids, et cetera, in my high school. And I think from their care and work and attention and their own expertise of caring for animals, of raising them, of the marketing tools that they learn to uh, take their cattle or rabbits or chickens or pigs to this auction and have people in town bid against each other, I think it was one of the best educations I've had. Um, and I, I mentioned that you might think, geez, this is off to quite a curveball of a start for an energy seminar. But you know, I, I think that there's a, an element to that background that is both about the sort of uh, life experience that a lot of people 
in rural parts of the country, in Appalachia, in even rural parts of California, experience that differ from a lot of what the rest of the country maybe thinks of and, and thinks of as a pathway through higher education, into business, into whatever career pursuits are in front of us. And you know, fast forward, I did go out of state for school. I ended up in, in policy and politics. And it was truly the, one of the greatest coincidences or circumstances of my life to get reconnected with uh, Senator Manchin uh, right after he had won re-election in late 2018. And truly on the morning that he was announced as ranking member, so the top minority or top Democrat on the Energy Committee, I had requested a meeting to talk to him about some policy ideas and working with his staff from my then role at, at uh, Center for American Progress. And I instead handed him my resume and said, I'd like to work for you. And he hired me a few months later, and we were off to a start uh, that I don't think either of us could have foreseen. And uh, you know, four years later, it led to a lot of really incredible work, really hard work. But um, I think throughout all of that, the, the hard work, the sense of community, and being able to align with his values and his vision for a lot of the legislation that we worked on together um, drew on those experiences of meeting people of, yes, my parents sort of volunteering me to uh, join 4-H and to do the hard work of, of raising pigs and thinking through all of that. Um, but it drew on those experiences in a way that really shaped a lot of how I now think about um, energy policy, which you know, I think there's a jump between the lived experiences in places that may not, ex may not have the same types of investment, same types of um, you know, economic development and, and planning, but are uh, no, less, no less the part of our country, no less uh, lacking in um, expertise and, and skills and talent. Um, and so I think a lot of the work that we're now starting to see play out in implementing the Inflation Reduction Act and implementing the other laws um, is an attempt to really address some of the investment and to to think about how to um, reinvest where places in, in places where uh, there have been downturns in the energy economy, but there are major, major opportunities to involve people, to create good jobs, and to think about how the entire country uh, can face these issues like climate change uh, going forward. So yeah, it, it is a, a definite experience that I've been able to carry forward in unique ways. And I owe you know, definitely my parents for pushing me in that direction at the beginning. It is a unique story for an energy policy analyst in the Beltway. Yes. <laughs> and a unique perspective, but n not uh, out of the ordinary across the rural landscapes where most of the renewable energy development occurs. Renewable energy development is dominantly developed in rural communities, and they have a stake, a deeper stake, in the terms of trade that are not often recognized by a, a party that is deeply tied to urban areas in the United States. And that's, I think, one of the tensions that you've helped resolve by just sharing that piece of your life story. We've been joined uh, by folks I recognize around the School of Sustainability, including those that have experience in federal service. And they've already shared, like Sally Benson, I see, a former chief for energy, national energy strategy at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I see Jim Sweeney, who's served in federal energy policy roles in the past. I want to ask for you to join the legions that have participated in this seminar to share with us from your unique vantage point, how did it happen? Tell us something about the how beyond the what. And in particular, history wants to know, how did we recover from the moment when the Build Back Better negotiations were gone? And then suddenly, there was an Inflation Reduction Act. Can you bring us to that moment and tell us about how legislation of that level of historic significance can go through those dramatics? Yeah, it's, it's a story that we could 
turn this seminar into a three week long uh, conversation, but I think the the first element is there are you know four bills to consider, but really thinking about the two sort of major bills I think are the, the Energy Act of 2020, which was developed over really a year and a half of uh, sort of the the authorization process. So when a committee takes up various bills that individual senators have worked on, uh, considers them in a hearing, marks them up, or negotiates pieces, uh, changes some of the language, gets consensus in the committee, and then packages things together and moves it to the Senate floor for the broader vote. Um, that bill we went forward with after assembling, and uh, we were on the Senate floor uh, March 12th, 11th, 12th of 2020. Uh, we came up for a cloture vote, the, one of the procedural votes in the process. It happened to fail, so we're reconsidering how to move forward again. And then the Senate shut down like the rest of uh, most of the country did. So we shifted over into our pandemic mode and worked through um, on various projects. And then toward the end of, of that Congress, we saw opportunities largely through Senator Murkowski's leadership um, and, and Senator Manchin's leadership. And one thing of note, they're very close uh, co-leadership. Their, their friendship, they are, they are partners in many respects in the sense of negotiating and legislating and building agreement around um, that set of issues that went into the bill. And we were able to negotiate through the pandemic over Zoom or Teams or whatever we were using at the time to get it across the finish line. And you know, I say that's one pathway toward legislating. It, the authorizations, it's sort of the architecture that then Congress, through its Appropriations Committee, can follow up and add funding. So you write sort of the framework, and then you fill out uh, what the, the program looks like in terms of funding levels to pursue the goals of, of what you've written into an authorization bill. So then switching into the next Congress, there are several bills moving, but to focus in on first Build Back Better and then what became the Inflation Reduction Act, it was a, a funding bill. So given the margin of votes in the Senate, it was pursuing a, a reconciliation or budget reconciliation pathway, which follows a very um, specific set of rules named for um, former Senator Robert C. Byrd, also of West Virginia, but uh, a true, very gifted parliamentarian who crafted the rules around the budget process. So it really has to do with the revenues or expenditures of the federal budget and there are ways to potentially craft uh, new programs and provisions, but it really has to depend on spending or um, raising uh, federal funding. So we worked through a large set of initiatives, uh, moved forward, and given a number of factors, um, including inflation, other economic factors, uh, Senator Manchin decided not to support it um, in December of 2021. So Many of you may remember that time. It was a challenging time, I think, for everyone, including Senator Manchin, and, and facing political pressure from all sides. Uh, I think there was a, a sense of um, reconsidering some things, but moving forward with other legislation, including what became Chips and Science. So we're taking up other issues, moving forward with other bills. And then in March of 2022, so truly a short window after that time, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And suddenly, an outside set of circumstances shaped a lot of what was going on in the legislative conversation around this set of issues, which, yes, were climate focused, were economic development focused, but were also ultimately about energy security. They had provisions, the, the bill still has provisions about the law. It's now a law. <laughs> Uh, has provisions about supply chains, mineral supplies, um, and fuels. And at that time, there was a lot to consider with uh, natural gas markets, both the flows from Russia to Europe, um, the United States' ability to export to Europe to cover truly for heating through the winter, the upcoming winter, but also new considerations about what it might mean to think through uh, manufacturing for 
uh, heat pumps to supply our, our allies and trading partners. So the new lens of geopolitics totally shaped and reshaped the conversation. And you know, following the, the invasion, at some point thereafter, uh, Senator Manchin convened a bipartisan working group to think through what a new set of energy and climate um, provisions might look like. And so that group started working together, discussing the issues, what was facing Republicans and Democrats. And from that, we emerged with some familiar provisions, some new provisions, and move forward um, through the summer to continue to try and legislate and build support for what ultimately became the Inflation Reduction Act. There are some more, uh, and there's a few more bumps on the road, but that's kind of how the legislative process came together um, to get the language in place. And you know, I think it's, it's to his credit uh, to be able to think through more than one lens of how to shape energy policy and how to shape policies that respond to a lot of the political and, and economic and national energy security um, aspects of all of this. And it's also very much to the, the credit of the, the president and the Biden administration for continuing to do the work of the analysis and the preparation for implementing uh, what became law um, so that we can we have hit the ground running on implementing all of the, the provisions in three, if not four, of the major laws that are reshaping our economy, energy economy. Thanks for sharing those stories from the hot summer of 2022. It was hot. <laughs> it was hot. Take us to where you are now. You, you left your, your post in legislation as a policy advisor on the Hill to become the director of policy and program impact for one of the laws of the four mm -hmm. that you helped uh, steward to passage. And within it, there's a whole suite of tax credits for which guidance is required. And that team of lawyers cranking out guidance, cranking, 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 has an entire national audience that needs access to on-ramps, windows of opportunity, the cues for where to go and how to participate in the transition. What is a day in the life of the Director of Policy and Program Impact like at the US Department of Treasury? It's very exciting. I, I will say that, you know, thank you for the, the pie chart earlier. As you can, you can tell from the Inflation Reduction Act at large, the tax credits, tax incentives are a major part of the investments and incentives that are now available. And it's a portfolio of over 20 different credits and, and one deduction. And uh, you know, I think our role, my specific team, works with the tax attorneys and uh, our colleagues at the Internal Revenue Service, takes their incredible work. They have worked night and day to produce hundreds of pages of guidance and to follow the regulatory process that proposes rules, takes hundreds if not thousands of pages of incoming uh, stakeholder input from companies and advocates and um, groups across the spectrum of any given credit to process that and deliver you know, really equitable, balanced, and effective rules for claiming the tax credits. We take that, we try to uh, work with them to clearly and easily make that accessible to especially audiences and uh, potential users of these credits that have never encountered uh, the tax code before, in part because there are both small businesses that are starting up, there are entirely new entities to the tax code because one of the aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act is a mechanism called elective pay, uh, also known maybe more colloquial as direct pay. And that mechanism, again, back to your, your introduction, Holmes, uh, a lot of the, the entities that are major players in especially the electric power sector, rural co-ops, municipal power, public power, didn't have access to tax credits before. So, the, the former investment in production tax credits for things like wind and solar, you know, it was a great incentive, but a lot of these entities couldn't access them. The Inflation Reduction Act opens the door to tax-exempt entities to be able to build projects, place them in service, 
qualify as eligible entities, qualify the project to meet the guidelines that our tax policy team has put out. And through all of those, once they file, and once the IRS double checks for fraud on the front end, to prevent that, because we don't want fraud, but uh, once we do all of those steps, those entities can now receive that payment, that value of the incentive back as a cash payment. So there is this new incentive for both existing entities in the power sector, again, rural co-ops and public power, that, it, that truly are some of the biggest uh, power providers to communities across the country. And in rural areas, it is vitally important because they are the only power provider. They're often member-owned, and so that value is going back to members, including farmers and, and folks. There's one rural co-op in West Virginia that I often thought of when working on this bill. And it's, it's really important. That's one type of the investment and reinvestment in those communities because now they're able to sort of play on equal footing with um, investor-owned utilities and, and other players that could more easily access the, the tax credits. So our job is to educate folks to get the word out about um, those new mechanisms and overall about the, the prospect of uh, meeting our, our nation's uh, climate goals, our job creation goals, our energy security goals, all of these things, um, but also doing it in a way that builds these facilities, builds this infrastructure in places that matter so that um, you know, communities across the country see and, and experience the, the value of this investment and um, maybe don't feel as distant from that kind of build out and economic development. You mentioned that there's more than two dozen of the provisions to implement. Can you tell us about one that is your favorite? Easily. <laughs> Easily. Yeah, so uh, there is a tax credit uh, that goes by the, the number 48C. Um, it is the Qualifying Advanced Energy Project Credit, which is a, a little bit of a misnomer. It is a great investment tax credit that um, is a tool for manufacturers and existing industrial facilities to invest or reinvest in their facilities, either to build new uh, factory lines or uh, upgrade equipment or add equipment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at their sites. All of it is through this allocated credit, so it has a, a value of $10 billion and overall. And today, actually, um, the Treasury Department, the IRS, and, and our partners at DOE uh, just announced the new round of funding, so round two. So there's a $6 billion amount um, that will be open for applications uh, very soon. And importantly, $2.5 billion. So across the entire program, 40% of the investment is set aside for energy communities as defined by, by that provision. And it's uh, energy communities where coal mines have closed, where coal power plants have closed. And so that's a part where, again, relating back to this idea that a lot of communities who have powered the country for years, decades, um, haven't necessarily seen investments over time because the, the previous tax credits um, were fabulous instruments to incentivize the growth of wind and solar and other technologies, but weren't dedicated to directing investment necessarily or didn't have a bonus credit or a mechanism to really drive investment back to um, communities where uh, the downturn in, in the coal economy in particular was, was being faced. This is a tool where now companies that have an idea to build a manufacturing line for clean energy equipment um, across the board uh, can find a site, uh, apply, go through the process of, of selection with DOE and, and the Treasury, and you know receive a 30% tax credit that is truly a foundational and, and sort of a, a huge anchor to rebuilding and creating the jobs in those communities. So it's a way to sort of reinvest in a very focused and, and sort of concentrated uh, investment type. And it's exciting to, to see it take off. We've had one round um, allocated and 
we're looking forward to round two and, and beyond. So it's, it's a great tax credit. <laughs> well, I think there might be some tax credits that end up uh, notching a larger amount of money, but they might not matter as much as the place-based incentives that deliver investment to the places that are experiencing the most distress from mm -hmm. the transition. And I think that's the alchemy of the geopolitics that you sought to address with these place-based tax incentives. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn to the seminar participants for the Q&A uh, that's next, but I'm going to assure that Luke Bassett has the last word. So I'm going to invite anybody here who has been hearing Joe. <laughs> All right. I've got, I'm going to take these three people in the first row, not Sam Jonkers. Joby, you're next. And then Dylan. And I see you in the back. Awesome. Uh it's kind of curious the thought process behind why tax credits. If we have the opportunity to do subsidies, direct pay, electric pay, it seems easier. You don't need to find an equity partner. You don't need to do a swap. Like, just what was the logic behind going with tax credits? Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah. So I think there may be two answers to that question. One is you mentioned tax equity and the, the sort of traditional market structures uh, in the pre-IRA tax credit schemes, um, largely had to uh, create structures where a project developer would partner in a co-ownership model with an investor to then uh, be able to access, the investor would be able to access the tax credit, the project developer would get capital for the project and, and move forward. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, two mechanisms within it really focus on unlocking more of that investment. So on the one hand, for business uh, credits, for um, actors in the private sector perhaps, you can pursue transferability where you're uh, enabled to transfer the credit once to a third party. Um, and there are markets developing. There's uh, there's a portal that the Internal Revenue Service runs, and we're seeing activity. It is growing, and we're very excited about transferability. Just finalized the final rule recently, so that's a few hundred pages of, of exciting uh, tax credit analysis and guidance to read. But the other is direct pay that, that I mentioned. And I think, you know, to your question about why tax credits in general, there are a few reasons. One is it was familiar to a lot of the project developers and um, the market structure that already existed. So there was a, an interest in it from the investment community, from people who were from utilities, from people who were very familiar with how we deploy um, renewable energy or energy generation, electricity generation equipment writ large. And it was also because of the reconciliation bill and, and the process and, and the bird rule, which again goes back to an ability to show the connection of increasing or decreasing um, federal revenues or, or expenditures. And with a tax credit and the unique role that the Senate Finance Committee plays, um, because so much of their work is directly relevant to increasing revenue or uh, increasing expenditures, that was a clear pathway to think through any number of uh, types of infrastructure to build. So, for instance, some of the new credits, whether it's clean hydrogen production tax credit, um, existing nuclear production tax credit, um, or some of the new mechanisms like uh, direct pay, but also uh, the requirements around um, providing a prevailing wage and, and registered apprenticeship, those were all thought through and, and developed in ways that would, again, increase or decrease those uh, budgetary aspects. So we had to think about the policy outcomes and work through the constraints of that process in addition to reflecting what uh, the market conditions were so that we could quickly move and, and start getting projects deployed. Luke, before Dylan asks a question, I have a quick follow-on based on a conversation you had with me, which is to think about the counterfactual. What if all of these tax credits were grant programs instead? What if they had been authorized and then subsequently appropriated through the other duly constructed committee processes in order to put more conditions on who could receive the funds and what the funds could be used for? Dylan's already done. 
But it didn't happen that way because of the procedural context for navigating the pieces of legislation. And as a result, one of the open questions that I think is the heaviest burden on the administration today is how can these credits be assured to be benefiting communities where they're claimed? Can you speak to that point? Yeah, I think, I think that there are sort of two factors to consider. There are a lot of grants, uh, loan-making devices, and um, there are also provisions in the other laws that pass. So I think first it's really important to remember that the four laws work together, and, and it is truly a portfolio of investments and programs, including even in Chips and Science, which has provisions about uh, fusion and demonstrating fusion, so things on the horizon still, um, although becoming more real every day. Uh, that said, I think the other thing to consider with, in terms of implementing and, and how the tax credits play out, um, I think that the bonus credits in particular are some of the best guides to how projects might be deployed, but it is ultimately a set of tools that rely on both the private sector actors, which we're already familiar with the tax credits, and the set of decisions based on you know, their, uh, their business models to pursue different projects in different places, different needs, but then also this entire new set of entrants to the market where tax exempt entities, municipalities, uh, religious organizations, the list goes on, suddenly there's a new window where more specific needs that are tailored not just in the context of a bonus credit that might be for an energy community or through the low income uh, communities bonus program that is specifically focused on end uses that benefit low income communities. There are also new entrants where nonprofits can pursue the projects in a, in a way that opens up the incentives to them. So there is not a direct sort of set of rules and grant focused uh, provisions that aid the tax credits in targeting, but there is a broader sense of uh, hopefully openness and accessibility that differs from grants that may be constrained because of an amount of money allocated to a grant program and often the competitive nature of those programs. Mm -hmm. They have their own barriers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Dylan, and actually, Professor Wyant, does Dylan need a microphone to be heard? No. Okay. Got it, Dylan. Yeah, um, I have a question in a similar vein to what you were just talking about, which is like on a federal, like I guess a high level strategy view, how is it you're going about like addressing state and local hesitancies towards environmental change, especially like with communities that may historically have not been? consulted in environmental policy and thinking like how you think about like, the rights of indigenous people or like people who may live next to uh, major polluters and stuff like that. Um, historically, like, communities of color, low income communities. Mm -hmm. Like, What is that education discrepancy like in your experience and what strategies do you employ to get around those? That's an excellent question and it's one that is definitely central to uh, the, the outlook for Treasury and our, our strategy for educating the public about the tax credits. Um, and it reflects President Biden's focus on Justice 40 and a lot of the tools across the administration and federal government. I think specifically with, with our outreach, you're right that it does take extra effort at times to reach those communities. And so a lot of our work has been to identify partners who are already working in those communities or have uh, you know, at a more regional or national level, networks that they distribute information through and also identify the policy obstacles that they may face um, in addition to funding and financing obstacles on the front end. So it is an incomplete picture in part because even with the pace of things, we are still moving as quickly as possible, but um, still in the beginning stages of a lot of implementation. But I think through work in some of the really huge programs that are being announced even just this past week from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency with the Greenhouse Gas uh, Emissions Reduction Fund and the Solar for All program, there are a lot of overlapping programs that over the course of the next several months and years will start to see pieced together 
So it's not just a portfolio of different uh, programs that don't interact. It's a set of major investments that do interact. And so we hope to continue working with other federal agencies and those additional partners in the communities that are facing those issues to be able to work with them and, and piece together while also not giving tax advice, because as a Treasury official, I can't give tax advice. <laughs> Disclaimer. Uh, piecing together and, and sort of working through how project finance plans are made and potentially where outside partners, uh, funders, foundations, and so on can work together to help those communities specifically. There's a gentleman in the back, and I'm going to give Luke the last word, and then I want to, uh, let me just say now, there is a reception after this seminar, so please stay, enjoy, and honor the organizers of the Energy Seminar and the directors of the Institute for Energy that have sustained it all these years. Next, there is a dinner with the business school students, a lunch with the law school students, there is an afternoon with the Schultz and Schneider Fellows, there is an evening at Explore Energy House. If you have not had enough of your opportunities to speak with Luke Bassett, there are more. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been in, in incredibly indulgent of my lines of inquiry and I think others that have met with him today. I'm going to ask, what, t tell us your name. Jim Parnell. Jim Parnell yeah. is going to pose the last question from the audience and then Luke is going to wrap us up. Yeah, so I get the next to the last word. Uh, that's great. I, I didn't realize all the things I was going to miss. I'm ready for the reception, but all these other things uh, I didn't hear about. So thank you, first off, from my perspective to West Virginia for all that you've uh, had influence on this legislation. I, as a, as a homeowner, I absolutely made use of this for solar and for uh, heat pump and things like that, and, and it really was important. One thing, though, I, I'm really interested in, kind of how does it all add up, particularly when you go to the more industrial or commercial applications of this? Like you were talking about, you know, something that comes in where there used to be coal mining, now you're bringing something in. How does this all add up in terms of um, kind of the greenhouse gas reduction or something like that? Can, can, you, can you put any numbers on, on what comes from the residential side versus what comes from the more commercial side of things, and are we having an impact yet? It is a fantastic question and a really challenging one, in part for two reasons. Um, first, as, as a part of the Treasury Department and working with our partners over at IRS, we often get the question of, what are you seeing? How many credits for this or that have been um, sent out, and what's the uptake for um, this equipment or that equipment, all of your tax data is protected um, very seriously by, uh, by laws that the IRS and, and Treasury implement. And so part of, part of that question is hard to answer because of those privacy protections. But we're also very much in the first phases of even receiving information from filers. Uh, tax season just ended uh, back a few days ago feels like a, a few months ago, but um, that's just in Treasury terms. So the other, the other aspect is businesses often file extensions. So we may not have the first real sense of tax credit uptake for the IRA provisions until later in the year, um, if not even a little bit later. Separate from all of that, and in terms of the real greenhouse gas emission reductions factors across the entire swath of the laws, not just the IRA, but in general, there's a, a little bit of a delay in terms of gathering that data from the EPA's perspective. So what I can say is there are uh, just projections at the moment of uh, analysis that we used when we were working on the, the bills um, to sort of guide us and think through trade-offs of one sector or one program versus another. Um, I'll admit that my knowledge of those numbers is based on that time period, and so it's probably out of date. <laughs> so I'd be happy to, to follow up with specific numbers, but I think um, one example is the Department of Energy has, has produced analysis about the potential for greenhouse gas emission reductions um, as a result of the, the various laws and, and their interaction. And so I'd, I'd point you to 
DOE's Office of Policy for that analysis. Um, but again, you know, I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of interest in and initial data that we're seeing about um, folks pre-registering and going through the portal that I mentioned at the IRS for new projects, either using direct pay or transferability. Uh, there's also a different part of that portal where we're seeing point of sale uh, credit transfers for EV purchasers at car dealerships. So we're seeing very initial numbers. And ultimately, the law was passed August 16th of 2022. It took several months to staff up and have folks in the administration really start running at the pace needed to produce guidance, to uh, send out the, the rules and application notices for funding opportunities across the other departments. So I think we're on the cusp of starting to see that initial uh, impact analysis, but not quite there yet. I think I just heard you send out a hailing signal to data scientists to get ready for a hailstorm <laughs> of federal data in future years to contribute to policy analysis and insight on program impact. Did I hear that? I think you did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you do get the last word. Well, I'll first, thank you again. Uh, this is a great opportunity to be here and, and share all of this with you. I think the, the two points, two or three points I would make are you all have a role in all of this, both in terms of what you pursue after you graduate, after you, um, you know, wrap up master's degrees, PhDs, go into business, go into startups, go into academia. Um, there is potentially a ton of data. There's potentially a ton of new widgets to work on. And I think the most important part to think through in relating back to my uh, sort of initial framing of um, you know, joining 4-H and, and raising pigs and thinking about life in West Virginia, there's a whole swath of the country that also needs your talent and your business models and your energy, literally and uh, figuratively, to, to help sort of overcome some of the obstacles, politically and otherwise, to do even more going forward, whether that's more implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act and, and the tools that we have at our fingertips, but also potentially new ideas and, and new um, policy pathways um, in the future. So. It's an incredible opportunity. It's been a really incredible set of things to work on. Um, but there's only job security in pursuing these projects and this infrastructure. And it's just some of the most exciting years are ahead of us in building all of these solutions to economic development and reinvestment in our communities while we're also tackling climate change. So I hope you cross the Sierra Nevada range and consider, you know, pursuing things a little further east, um, west of Virginia. But yeah, it's a great opportunity. And thank you again. So I just have two, two reactions. One is on behalf of all of us. It seems like the story, uh, Luke and Holmes, are, you were the right guy in the right place at the right time. <laughs> So we really appreciate that, and we're looking forward to working with you and helping you do even more uh, amazing things in the future. And secondly, you were a very good choice. Thank you again, Holmes, for the 400th uh, <laughs> seminar. And now we get a chance to go outside, right out the door, up the steps to celebrate that. So thanks again for, from all of us to Luke and Holmes. Thank you. Thank you.